Wow, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm like super excited to be here because um, this seminar was really what um, got me into HCI. So I was a grad student, I was a PhD student here from 2006 to 2012. And as Michael mentioned, I did not start out in HCI, but taking the HCI intro class and, uh, and going to these seminar talks um, really inspired me to get into HCI. So I actually had several of my bucket list dreams. One of them in grad school was to give a Google Tech Talk. Um, and the other one was to be invited to give a, a, a seminar talk here. So I, I've checked those things off. So now, now my life is complete for the most <laughs> part or something. No, there's more stuff I want to do. Um, all right, so who wants to learn programming uh, nowadays? So a lot of people do. Um, most obvious population, if you want to be a software engineer, these are great jobs. They're everywhere internationally. You have to learn programming. If you want to be a data scientist, which is a, a really fast-growing role in industry now, um, it involves uh, basic programming skills. Uh, in fact, if you want to be a scientist or engineer in any field, uh, you have to learn programming. So this is one of my best friends from childhood. His name's Kevin. He's on the left here. You think that he's an oceanographer, so you think that he's out on the ocean doing all this glamorous science stuff, but he only spends probably a few percent of his time doing that. And most of his time, he's hunched over in front of the computer uh, processing and analyzing and graphing data. So scientists and engineers of all stripes um, now want to learn programming. Even more broadly, uh, now people in all sorts of business and non-technical roles are flocking to learn programming, both in college and also on the job. Uh, we have a CHI paper coming out in the CHI conference in a few months uh, where we surveyed and interviewed a lot of uh, non-technical people at large technology companies asking them about their motivations for learning programming. And, um, and you could read up on that on my website. There has been a lot of excitement around uh, learning programming in school uh, recently. So there's all these initiatives about coding, uh, code.org, an hour of code, and all this stuff about uh, in-school settings. So in school, you have things like one-on-one -on -one tutoring, where people are drawing diagrams and, uh, and kind of tutoring you in a very high-touch way. You have pair programming and peer learning, where you're in the computer lab and you're, uh, you're working together. Um, in, in these uh, lab settings. You have one-to-many tutoring. So you have, uh, you have computer labs with maybe 20 or 30 students, and you have an instructor or TA walking around uh, assisting people. And one of my colleagues, Mark Guzdal, recently released this book that surveyed over 300 papers in the uh, computing education literature, which mostly looked at uh, techniques and tools for helping people learn programming better in a school setting. So there's a lot of really great people working on improving, improving and studying this. Um, but what I'm interested in is a far larger population. And it's observation, the majority of people who want to learn programming or learn anything for that matter are not in school. So since we're at a university, we think of learning as you know, K-12 or college. But in fact, there are people of all ages and stripes all around the world who want to learn these really practical skills like programming, but they don't have access to in-person resources. So this is Mrs. Hamilton, uh, she's 62 years old. She's one of the uh, user survey respondents. So she's currently working as a document assistant in a law firm, so she's essentially a typist. And uh, she's been learning online using various resources such as mine. And uh, she writes, I wanted to learn computer programming so as to establish a new career and have some independence. So this is somebody who's over 60 who is in a job and wants to start pivoting into something uh, perhaps more technical or perhaps more, um, more lucrative. But uh, the most frustrating aspect of learning online is I do not have a teacher on a face-to-face -face basis, such as in a classroom environment. And this has impeded me greatly. Um, so kind of survey responses like hers are representative of some of the frustrations people are feeling when they have to learn online, that they don't have access to all these great things that we take for granted in a formal educational setting. Um, so the central challenge that motivates the work I'm presenting today is the following question. It's how can we scale up the benefits of face-to-face -face learning uh, to the rest of the world? And I want to start with programming as an exemplar because it's an example of a really cognitively complex and also a very really in-demand skill set. Uh, but these ideas that I talk about may generalize to learning other sorts of complex skills at scale as well. So throughout the talk, I'm going to touch on this theme of what about going beyond just programming. Uh, the way I want to uh, I want to think about this this journey throughout the hour is this design space with two dimensions, with scale on one axis and with fidelity on the other. So on one extreme, there's face to face, which is extremely high fidelity, but very low scale because you have to be there co-located in person. And on the other extreme, we have uh, static online materials. This is learning from reading a PDF or reading somebody's lecture notes they put online or a PowerPoint or YouTube video. 
And uh, the way I approach my work in the past few years is to first get inspired by the best practices in face-to-face -face learning, by things that we know uh, to work effectively face-to-face. Um, and then think about designing systems for scale from day one uh, to overcome these limitations of face-to-face. -face. And then finally, leveraging the scale to make discoveries and then to drive the, the next steps and the next projects. So the outline of this talk is following is I'm going to first present a, a visualization platform and then talk about two specific uh, social learning systems built on top of that and then conclude with some uh, discussion of future work. But before I start talking about the systems, which comprise most of this talk, I want to do uh, kind of get into a little bit of theory of learning. So um, there's a lot of literature out there that shows that learning programming is really, really hard. And for those of you in the audience who have been programming for years, it's easy to forget how um, difficult of a task this is for, uh, for many novices. And uh, in, you know, one way to summarize the essence of why learning is hard on one slide is the following, is that you have a learner here. They're writing some code. So this is Python, but it could be any language. They have to compile and run the code, and then this gets output. Something gets output on the screen. So in a mainstream text-based language, you're writing text and you're outputting text. Um, what you have to do is stare at this input-output pair. So there's three print statements here, and there's three lines printed. And you have to think, what just happened in the computer to uh, bring this input that I wrote to this output? You know, wh why did this happen? And this is something that's so basic that those of you here who are expert programmers don't even think of it. This is subconscious. Um, and this is the mental model of, of what happened in the computer. Um, there's three global variables, and there are five lists. They each point to a list. This is a nested list. So this fully explains uh, this input-output pair. This is what people do all the time. Um, the problem here is that this is completely wrong. Um, this is a completely incorrect mental model. And it turns out that novices come with all these misconceptions about how programming works based on prior knowledge, uh, mostly about uh, prior knowledge of math or prior knowledge of um, kind of folk interactions with computers. So we see this in physics education also. People, the, the real world in physics is very different than the idealized F equals MA world that you learn in, um, in physics class. One of my colleagues in his dissertation, uh, part of his dissertation, documented 162 of these misconceptions in this, in this giant table. The cool thing he did is he not only wrote the, he not only taxonomized them, he actually wrote the primary sources of the, uh, the, lit the primary literature that studied them. So here's two examples, their sources. One example is assignment moves a value from one variable to another, when in fact it actually copies. So if you say something assigns something else, it actually makes a copy instead of moving. And the other one is objects know what refer to them. So like the pointers point from the object to the thing that is referring to them. And those are both false. Um, so if you know programming, those, that, those seem silly, but it's well documented that beginners have all sorts of these, these sorts of misconceptions about how the computer works behind the scenes. The good news is that uh, visualizations uh, and diagrams are really effective at clarifying and, uh, and, and remedying these misconceptions. So if there's only somebody that drew a diagram for you and showed you how this worked inside the computer, um, then the act of studying these visualizations um, uh, for novices, what happens is that it reduces extraneous cognitive loads. And when you're learning and you just you don't have pictures, then there's all this cognitive load and think and trying to comprise these diagrams yourself, and um, not enough uh, uh, extra load to actually learn. So if you see diagrams in front of you, um, it's uh, it's an effective way to kind of start solidifying these um, these mental models in your long-term memory. So in fact, in this case, uh, this is the right picture here. Um, is that there are actually only two lists and they're shared. Um, so this is the Python semantics. It's not obvious if you haven't learned Python before. So the underpinnings of my work kind of uh, basically the scope of the project I'm going to present um, are, are of the following. Is that first is that building these proper mental models are uh, foundational. They're prerequisites for learning anything more advanced. So before you can get to understanding how to do software engineering or work on teams or do idioms or design patterns, you have to really know, know nuts and bolts. What is the computer even doing with my code? Or else you're just basically scrambling and, and, and having these misconceptions. Second one is that studying these pre-made visualizations is an effective first step before, say, the teacher makes you draw your own. And this is, um, this is an effect called the worked example effect in uh, educational psychology, which states that having examples shown to you first with good explanations will, uh, is a lower cognitive load activity, again, that will allow you to spend more of your attention on learning rather than on trying to construct yourself first. So there's value in seeing these diagrams for, for novices. And finally, these visualizations are most effective for early stage novices, people who are just learning. And that basically what happens is you wean off them over time. So as expert programmers here, you don't 
draw visualizations for every single thing. This stuff happens in your mind. The schemas are, are quite different. Um, but it turns out that, that this is a, a really important foundation for novices. Okay, so we know that visualizations are important. Um, so how do we generate them? So the traditional way to generate those is to have humans draw them. So humans draw these visualizations all the time when you're tutoring on a blackboard or um, just on paper. And the question here that I started with is how do we scale this up? Specifically here is how can computers automatically generate these visualizations and, um, and how will people end up um, using them? So to start investing in this question, I've been working for the past few years on this visualization platform called Rosetta that uh, automatically generates these diagrams. So this uh, site is more commonly known as the Python Tutor because it's the domain name I registered years ago. Um, and, uh, but now it has grown to many languages uh, and some more are coming soon. So this is kind of a language independent site by this point. Um, what, it's just simply a web-based thing where you can just write or copy and paste code in. So you just write your code. This is the code from the exact code from the demo. You hit the visualize button and then that sends the code to a server. The server has some uh, machinery to instrument uh, your code, analyze it, run it in a sandbox, and then it produces a, a value trace of everything that happened when your code was running. And then that brings you back to an interactive visualization on the web. So you write or copy code here, and then it goes, makes a round trip, and you see something like this. So it looks like a visual debugger. There's an arrow here. There's a slider. There are buttons. And when you click the forward button or when you, uh, when you slide, it will run the first line of code. So there's x equals abc. And in Python, the, the model is there is a global frame here. There's x, and the points to a list. Right, and then second line, y equals x. This is the line that's not obvious if you haven't learned Python before because Several things might happen, but if you actually run it, you'll see that they both point to the same thing. And then as you keep running, the diagram starts evolving, and, uh, and there's the printout down here like the terminal. You can also go backwards. There's actually no trick here because all the code has already been run on the server and processed, so this is just a thing we can slide back and forth. Um, so this thing has been deployed for a few years, but I'm hardly the first person to think about the idea of automatically generating these diagrams. So um, my colleague has this great survey paper surveying dozens of these systems from the past few decades. So this is for Modula 2, which is a language I've never used. But uh, you know, it shows code, it shows the arrows, it shows these things. They all look, kind of feel like uh, same flavor. What he found in the survey was that from a systems perspective, these were all custom built with one language in mind, a Modula 2, and one vocabulary, one static set of diagrams. Um, the practical implications of that is that they get really obsolete really fast over time. So I don't think anyone teaches in this language anymore. Um, so uh, as a result, these things are really prototypes made for demonstrating certain visualization ideas or certain pedagogical ideas. And none of them have scaled beyond just their original um, use site. And he ends his survey, my colleague ends his survey paper with a quote I really like, which is, building a system that sees genuinely widespread adoption may require departure from the prevalent, I made a prototype for my thesis, mode of system development, uh, which is something I was guilty of myself as well in my PhD. Um, so knowing that, I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to just make another thing that's just, you know, the same ideas as before. I really wanted to design for scale. So that's the theme uh, throughout the talk. Yes, James. Just about the time that that work was done. I mean, the web had barely existed. If you had done yours just for Python on the web, and it just happened to catch on, do you think it would have worked out? Um, or, yeah, I think. Or just that you had to think about scale and designing it to make sure when it did work out that it was not going to fail. I think it. I think it's a bit of both. Is that 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 timing thing? I mean, timing of web obviously coincided with that. And um, there was, I think there's a lot of co-design as well of once it started taking off a bit, thinking about some of these design points helped it gain momentum. But yeah, I mean, this would not have been possible without the web, right? If we were on, you know, whatever 286 assembly language, this is probably not going to work. That's right. So, so, time, so you preempted my first bullet point was the fact that this came at a time when the open web was starting to be mature enough that you could do everything without software, without plug-in installations. Um, and the big design decision here that is different than what people are doing in MOOCs and other things is to not have user accounts, is that I wanted to have minimal friction to using this, even if it means we don't track as much data. We can't uh, track as fine um, as fine grained. We can deal with that with surveys and other things. Um, the second thing is because again, once we have since we have the open web, really simple feature that turned out to be effective is to generate a snapshot URL. So all the state can be encapsulated in just the 
you know, in just a GET request here. So you can generate a URL uh, and minify it or whatever, and you can end up uh, spreading this virally. So you're on a MOOC and you want help in something and you say, hey, look, check out this visualization I'm, I'm starting a play with. Can you help me with it? Or you IM this to a friend. And this is a way that it spreads not only you can get help, but if someone is in a MOOC forum or one of these Stack Overflow and these online courses, they see a link to pythontutor.com, blah, 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 some visualization, they think, oh, what is this Python Tutor site? And they go and use it and bookmark it and spread it. Other way it spreads, again, very standard for the, uh, in the web era is uh, embedding. So you can generate JavaScript code or iframes to s easily embed these live visualizations and code editors and anything else. So people have embedded this in MOOCs, embedded this in digital textbooks, and again, spread it really organically. Um, the last thing about scale is more about longevity, um, is the fact that um, I've made this, I started this with Python as the site shows, as the site name shows, but I started thinking about how do we make this into a more general platform for visualizing things in other languages because you know, I, there's no guarantee that Python is going to be a popular teaching language in five or ten years or so. But I want this platform to keep living on and evolving. Uh, and the way to do so is to um, to have a more modular graphics um, vocabulary and engine. So um, I implemented this grammar graphics, which is a classic idea from digitalization, and adapted it for the purposes of visualizing what goes on inside of computers while code is running. Um, for some design inspiration, uh, I flipped through many, many books. So if you look through textbooks and programming books that have diagrams in them in all sorts of languages, you'll find that the graphical vocabulary is actually reasonably limited. So they have these box and pointer diagrams, they have these things stacked, they have nested boxes and, and layouts and such. And I came up with a, a fairly parsimonious grammar. Um, there's more details inside, but basically what it has, it has an idea of a memory block. Uh, which has an address that you can point to, and then inside there's either a primitive or a collection of, of things. Uh, the, a primitive is what you normally think of in, in a language, a number, a string. Also, an image can be a primitive because we're on the open web, so you can imagine if your programming language or your, uh, your environment is manipulating pictures, you could have those be elements in your visualization. Uh, there's no reason why we have to strict with strings. A collection is simply a list of blocks along with a layout that shows the, uh, tells the engine how to lay them out. So these are horizontal, vertical, grid, tree, graph. These cover the kinds of data structures you want to uh, render. And because collections have blocks and blocks have collections, you can get this nesting. Um, you also have an idea of a pointer to join things together. So how do we use this uh, uh, grammar to, to implement stuff for new language? So at a super high level view of the graphics engine is uh, from the user's perspective, you're writing code on the site. You are running it on the server using some kind of tracer. This tracer has to be written for each language because you have to be able to parse and execute and, and process that language. So here are some examples. Uh, Python uses the debugger. Ruby has some kind of API for tracing code and C uh, and uses this thing called Valgrind, which instruments binaries. Uh, so once you have the trace, this actually uh, runs the code and, pr and produces some data structure that's everything that happened when your code is running, the stack, the heap, the values, the types. These are all specific to the language. So the other thing you need, the other part of this equation, is some kind of spec that the uh, creator of the tool writes once. And this spec roughly says, how do you map Python's data structures into Rosetta's grammar that you saw on the previous slide? Or how do you map the C data structures in the grammar? Uh, you put those two together in a step and you create a scene graph. And that the vocabulary in the scene graph is the grammar that I showed in the previous slide. And then you can run it through a rendering pass as usual. So HTML for a web page. You can, if you want to render a book, you can do PDF. If you want to do audio rendering, which I think would be a cool um, thing for accessibility, you can render this representation in any way you want. You know, why I go through all this indirection and abstraction is because we want to separate out the language specific from the language agnostic part. So everything below is language agnostic so we can reuse. So in effect, that makes it easy to add new languages because all you have to do is add a new tracer and add a new spec to map those language values into Rosetta's generic grammar. So I've implemented for seven languages so far, and it's, it's at this point, it's fairly routine. Uh, it's just routine engineering work um, to add more. And you can be really flexible in choosing your abstractions. I don't have time to go through all the pictures, but you really, as the creator of this tool uh, for your language, you get to choose the level of abstraction you want um, and how you show diagrams. So as a result of this uh, kind of 
combination of engineering design work and, and timing uh, that coincided with online education coming up about, um, there's been a tremendous amount of usage for this project. So the y-axis shows uh, pieces of visualized code. So every time someone is running the code and hitting visualize, there's, it goes on the y-axis. So it's been out about three years now. So every day there are tens of thousands of pieces of code visualized by 5,000 plus uh, users. Uh, what's more interesting to me beyond just pure numbers is the breadth of usage from people around the world. So we have people from almost every country. This is a dense, shows density. Um, the only thing that's missing is, is Central Africa due to you know, likely lack of uh, good internet access. Uh, so I put some simple user demographic surveys on the site. And it turns out that over half the people are, are non-college or K-12 age, right? These are people over 25 years old. And interestingly, about six of them are over 55. So they're kind of like the Mrs. Hamilton person there, um, that these are really are people around the world of all age groups who are learning in various ways, taking online courses, maybe self-teaching, and using this as a tool to supplement their learning. So um, some user survey excerpts of how people use this. There, there's plenty more um, on the web. Is, you know, it allows me to visualize the code step by step and to see what uh, order different components and often code get triggered. I always wonder this, and this tool has helped me understand this better than any other resource information. This idea of building the mental models by surfacing what's underneath. Uh, debugging use case, I love it because it draws out the scope of things going on, making concepts like mutability easier to understand. I also like for general troubleshooting, let trace through the code and what is actually going on compared to what I think should happen. Um, so what have we learned from uh, work on this project? Um, first, the, the kind of key idea here is that surfacing uh, what I call procedural state, what is going on inside the machine at some appropriate level of abstraction, um, is useful for both building mental models and also for debugging code and, and correcting misunderstandings. That designing for scale made it uh, so far the most widely used tool for this sort of visualization in, in many decades of prior work, um, and that the obvious kind of Next step for this platform is to start deploying uh, more controlled experiments to measure these learning effects more concretely. So, so in these lab studies, people have shown kind of learning effects in the lab that you know these visualizations are an effective thing. But you know, online we have not shown this yet. Yes, question. Are you talking about designing for scale? Is that mostly like the back end, or like are there front end user interaction? design for scale? Yeah, that's a good question. The question about, uh, you know, is this architecturally designing for scale in terms of the back end or front end? I, I kind of mean it more in an abstract way of the kind of features I showed you about, you know, not requiring accounts, about being able to be modular, extended to different languages, having the URL sharing everything. I mean, this is not Facebook scale, right? So the back end doesn't need to, we can do very standard things. So that, that isn't really too innovative. It's for, yeah, it's more about thinking about longer term usage. Um, yeah, so the next really obvious thing to do is think about really controlled experiments. And we have this platform with thousands of people on it um, every day to really start measuring uh, uh, you know, learning effects and retention effects and such. And we have a platform by which to launch that now. So in this design space here, where I would put this is a, as an improvement over these static online materials. That the ability to visualize procedural state uh, gives you a bit of more fidelity, at least, than reading, say, a, a PDF or, or watching a video. And thinking beyond programming, um, can surfacing this step-by-step -step procedural state help people learn other sub subjects, right? Learn math or physics. So you can imagine math and physics being amenable to this similar idea of decomposing things into steps or doing proofs or, or those things. But what about law? So, you know, legal documents are these dozens of pages of dense, uh, dense text, uh, what about visualizing that? So, so some people have started manually doing this, of kind of encouraging design of uh, more visual sorts of legal briefs. And I think there's opportunities to try to think about using NLP or things to automatically extract logical sort of statements from, from legal documents and try to uh, surface those as well. Um, but there's still a problem. I mean, so far, there's still no human in the loop, right? So Mrs. Hamilton's original frustrations have not been met yet, that there's still no person helping her along. She can see these visualizations just fine, but uh, she needs someone to explain them to her. So to start addressing this issue, I've um, I created this tool called Coachella, and I had two of my master's students help me run a, uh, a case study on it last year. For inspiration, I went to the computer lab. So this is a typical computer lab in any school. You see a lot of pair programming and debugging going on. You see a lot of pointing to the screen and talking about shared context. And people draw diagrams as well, because the, the computer by default doesn't draw them. So again, how can we scale this up? Um, and in particular here, the question is, um, how can we bring these in-lab interactions that are really high fidelity, high touch, kind of pair programming, collaborative learning interactions to people who can't 
actually meet up face to face. Um, and to uh, start addressing this question, I built this tool called Coachella, which is the first multi-user visualization system. And it's an extension on the Rosetta platform. So here's a demo. Uh, this is the Rosetta site, python2.com. You can write code, visualize. You can uh, visualize everything. And if you need help, click this button up here. And if your tutor is in a MOOC halfway around the world, you send them this URL. And then they join your session. So they're you know, somewhere in another part of the world. And you see multiple cursors. You see their cursor. Uh, all your actions are synchronized as well. And you can just chat in an embedded box like that. And then you can edit code. There's a collaborative editor um, all built in the site. So what this is trying to do is start to emulate the sort of interaction that people have in lab, um, except you can be anywhere doing this. Um, so ideas about designing for scale. So first of all, it's built on top of the Rosetta platform, which has already been scalable by this time. And the main things that I added were just the machinery and the back end for synchronizing cursors and state and chat and everything. Um, just like in using Rosetta, joining the session now is as simple as joining a web URL. Um, no installation, no screen sharing software. It's really lightweight. Um, you're just doing it right in your browser. So you can just send it to someone in a forum. The multiple cursors are a really lightweight way to emulate uh, some sort of presence. So you can actually see people waving around saying, look, look here. And finally, text chat is more scalable than, say, doing something like video, um, both for bandwidth reasons, if you're halfway around the world, and also it's sort of a lower barrier to entry thing, so that if you're Mrs. Hamilton in a MOOC, you might be kind of uh, shy and not want to video chat with a tutor around the world you don't know, but text chatting or you know, writing forms may be okay. The design point of this tool is really for one-on-one -on -one tutoring like this, or small groups. You can imagine five people entering a room together with five cursors and chatting. But you don't want to scale this up too much more because uh, you're all sharing one session. So some questions about this is, one, can it bring these in-lab interactions to people who uh, cannot meet up face-to-face? -face? And uh, can people actually learn and feel some sort of human connection uh, using this tool? So to investigate these questions, we uh, we deployed it to the website for about a year and a half. Uh, simply a button up here, there's a little FAQ, but we did not do a, uh, we didn't have any task or paid recruitment. We wanted to see, we have all these thousands of people on the site in a naturalistic way who are already learning online. Um, would they make use of this resource, uh, this additional resource we put here in their naturalistic learning? And if so, how would they do it? So uh, the data shows that, in fact, it did connect people who are remote, uh, which is good. So there are 740 sessions after we filtered for junk sessions that, that weren't anything of substantive. So these are actually sessions where people were actually chatting and interacting. Uh, they came from hundreds of uh, cities, dozens of countries. Uh, the important data point here is that almost half the sessions were multiple city ones. So these are actually people who found each other somehow, maybe on their MOOC, maybe on some form, and were working with each other, and one six from multiple countries. So obviously these people could not have gotten together next door um, and gone over to each other's um, dorms to, to, to chat. So this uh, graph is connecting countries if there's a session uh, where people participate in those countries. Again, because this data was all anonymous, no accounts, we don't know the detailed demographics of these people. But I suspect that these were taking people taking online courses together. Yes, Michael. So just 740 compared to the numbers you were showing before, I wonder, like, what, what is sort of the engagement level here? Like, you know, what percentage of people who were actually using <coughs> Uh, the Python tutor to look at stuff themselves ended up creating a shared session. And, it, and are you, you think that's low or high? Yeah, it's so a good question. Good. Yeah, so the question I asked was, given the you know millions of people on the site, the 740 number, you know, you know how how does that relate? Um, it is a bit on the low end. I I I think that um, I, because I think all we did we just, we just put this button on and just said you know there's like an FAQ here. Uh, we didn't advertise this in any particular way. There was no structure around them, and this is exactly the site. So um, yeah, I mean, I think these numbers are a bit low. But again, uh, we didn't you know, we didn't purposely try to pump up those numbers or, or encourage in a structured way. Like imagine if this were deployed as part of a course and there was a curriculum around it, then we would have more controlled usage. Yeah, so this is the, the numbers are what they are. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, all right, so you know, this is kind of the naturalistic, as kind of Michael question alluded to, this is just in the wild, this is sort of the amount of usage we get. And I think part of the, the reason for the percentage of sessions created over total users being low is that we actually don't have a way of connecting people together currently. You actually have to know somebody to do this. So not everyone is going on this site. So this kind of 
naturally preview some future work. Uh, it turns out that people interacted like they would in lab. Uh, so by coding, manually coding the uh, chat logs for, uh, for activity intent, there are two things that just, two kinds of activities that just popped up really apparently from the log. So one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is one person is clearly the expert and working with someone else, and then peer learning, which is two or three or five people trying to figure stuff out together. There's about a 40-60 split, roughly evenly. So this is, this is sort of what you would see in lab. Um, example logs, this is just the tutor speaking. Um, so this is an example of a pretty good tutor who is Socratically narrowing down the space and helping the learner debug and having learners answer questions. Um, so we saw some really good tutors on this. Uh, we saw some tutors that weren't as good. Uh, <laughs> it, it varied a lot. And uh, future work is thinking about how do we structure the tutoring sessions. Peer learning was, you know, there's two people here, so you imagine two or three people hashing something out together, like you're working on homework. And, you know, peer tutoring sessions, uh, peer learning sessions were a lot more tentative and back and forth. And you notice how people were actually interacting with the visualization. So people appeared to learn in sessions. So because, again, we're not doing a controlled learning experiment, we're doing it in the wild naturalist appointment, the, the main thing we can say is whether the chat logs indicated that some knowledge was being transferred. Um, to give a sense of how long these sessions were, they were you know, dozens of minutes. So this is comparable to if you're sitting there face to face with someone in front of a computer, um, you know, about a chat every minute. And there's way more visualization interactions than chat. So this is stepping, running, uh, going backwards, and such. Um, so the, by analyzing the chat log, they're both declarative and procedural knowledge was transferred. Declarative is, what is the syntax thing? What does this mean? Procedural is, let's step by step debug this problem. I'm at the lower three levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So Bloom's taxonomy is a six level hierarchy that shows increasing levels of sophistication in knowledge transfer. And we saw instances at these lower three levels. Um, many of the instances of knowledge transfer were anchored to the visualizations. So there were things where people were talking about things they're visualizing and playing with. So here's an example here you could read that's pretty dense and it doesn't make much sense if you don't see the picture, right? This is the sort of conversation you can only have if you're seeing a picture in front of you and going back and forth and pointing to it. Um, so that's kind of the value added of having a picture and the, and the text at the same time. So people also bonded emotionally, again, with the chat log. So there were these effective exchanges uh, that promoted motivation, uh, things friendly banter, showings of camaraderie, also encouragement, especially in tutoring sessions. So a learner says, oh my god, I'm so terrible, I'm sorry. Tutor says, not a problem at all, you've written little code yet, it'll take a while for it to become more comfortable. So we definitely saw these technical, technical, technical talk, and then there's some emotional bonding thing, and then more technical stuff. So this is you know, very different than, say, if you were just getting automated hints um, from, from, a, from a system. So what have you learned? Um, now first, this real-time substrate for discussing procedural state um, can be an effective substitute for people who otherwise can't get together face-to-face, -to -face, right? That you probably want to get together face-to-face -to -face if you can, but if you can't, then this starts emulating some of these uh, benefits. But more interestingly than the half the population who were in different cities, actually in a third of the sessions, it was being used even by people who were knew each other in real life. The way we coded for this is this they're indicators that they knew each other. They're like, we're going to go to this party tonight, or uh, this class is you know, terrible, or whatever, or you know, when is study hall? And they were using this tool, they were electing to use this tool, even when they could obviously been together. And this is um, kind of this classic HCI concept, design concept, being beyond being there, which is that you know, thinking about how do we design systems that people would prefer to use, even when they could just physically go to each other in real life. And I think this idea of discussing what's underneath uh, contributes to that. Yes, Michael. So Digging into that part of the, yeah. the logic behind the Beyond Being Area article is that you're providing technological affordances that couldn't have been available in the person to person in right. the, like co present scenario. I'm wondering what was it about Coachella that was better than being there? Like yeah. why were they opting to use it over staring at a laptop? Right, so that's a great question. So Mike, Michael's question is, you know, the, the big thesis here is that if we design, you know, there has to be some value added in the technology so that that's better than just face-to-face. -face. And I think the big thing is this idea of discussing procedural state, that we are uncovering the pictures automatically so we can, you know, we can talk about it rather than having you manually, say, draw them yourself. So I agree with this, but pushing it a little further. Uh, the, the comparison is not necessarily to not having Python Tutor. Mm -hmm. It's to having Python Tutor on my computer and you're sitting next to me. Right, right. So why are we using it in two different locations? Is it just it's more convenient because I'm in my dorm room and you're, you're in yours? Or, or is there something that this is actually providing beyond 
sitting next to each other in the lab using yeah, guidelines? That's a great question. Um, I think part of it, part of it is that it is this lightweight thing that you could kind of integrate into your, I'm already sitting in my dorm computering, and then this is just a lightweight thing rather than physically going somewhere. But, uh, but I should think about this more offline. But I was thinking more of it in terms of not having, you know, of the base case of, of this. Yeah. But I think you're, I, I think this is a really good point. Yep, James. To me, that it might be really interesting in the co-located situation to mm -hmm. see what is the effect of us both being able to drive right. while sitting next to each other and communicating easily verbally. Uh -huh. And is that worse or better than the share mouse situation, which people have studied a lot earlier mm -hmm. with kids and mm -hmm. learning situations? And I'm just really curious what it would happen in the situation. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, this is something we could definitely do in the lab. Like we have the, like both your points. We have this thing, and we just put them in lab, co-located, using it. Um, there are people who did this a few years ago in person with some kind of simpler visualization system. And one of their findings, I can dig up the paper. One of their findings is that uh, being able to talk about the visualization, at least in person, gave people that sort of teamwork camaraderie sense. They, they gave people that, that the benefits were more social of having them feel closer to classmates. And perhaps we don't get that as much in the online setting. Cool. So um, <coughs> the final thing is that these spontaneous effective exchanges um, show this interface can humanize online learning. This is not just about, let's just exchange facts. So this, this sort of, even if we have a low bandwidth chat, um, we could, people actually are engaging in ways that are non-technical. Non so uh, what Coachella is trying to do is to push out this, uh, this scale factor. Right? So we have lower fidelity uh, than face-to-face, -face, but we're scaling a bit better because we don't need a, uh, a person there you know, in, in person. We can be online. Um, thinking beyond programming, so can this idea of synchronized procedural state foster real-time critique in, say, a virtual art or a design studio where people are working on these procedural tasks? So if you're sculpting uh, or doing some kind of visual art, if we could, say, instrument the room or instrument these, uh, you know, these metal scaffolding and everything and be able to project your real-time state, can, can someone remotely tutor you and critique you doing this? Whereas right now, this sort of visual art and design stuff has to be very much in person. Uh, but there is a problem that, that came up when we were doing this project, which is pretty obvious in retrospect, which is that the tutor, there aren't that many tutors available, right? So if, if you're in a MOOC uh, or an online setting, you're Mrs. Hamilton, you can use this to summon a tutor, you ask for help. This is great for you. Uh, you have a personal tutor there. Uh, but the tutor, it's, it's a lot more limited because they can only help one person at once because they are, uh, they are bound to this one-on-one -on -one tutoring situation. And what if the tutor wants to help five students or 10 students or such? They have to open up five or 10 tabs and switch between them. And that the tutor attention is really the bottleneck to further scaling up um, being able to provide real-time help online is that because there are way fewer tutors and learners. Um, so how can a single tutor help more learners at once. Um, and that leads into uh, the system I created called CodeOpticon, which has nothing to do with TurkOpticon, a similar name, um, that I, I presented with a few months ago. Once again, for design inspiration, I went back to the computer lab. And this time, instead of looking at the students working, I looked at the instructors or their lab tutors. Um, the ideal thing for them is to provide timely and targeted help, which is someone raises their hand and they go up to them and they provide a targeted assistance right away when the context is, is fresh. Proactive help is also really important because what a really good tutor would be able to do is to scan the room and be situationally aware of how people are doing. And if someone looks like they're really stuck or frustrated, go up to them and, and offer assistance. Um, many learners are either shy and they don't want to ask for help, or they're uh, too fixated on debugging something and they don't know when they should step back. That's the ideal. Reality doesn't really match that, right? You have 20 to 1 ratio, 30 to 1, 50 to 1. There are just way more uh, students in the lab than tutors. So it's a best effort scramble. It's physically exhausting to run around the lab. And you know, if you have lab hours for an hour, it's actually really tiring to run around. So how can a single tutor help more learners at once um, without suffering from as much fatigue? And um, I wanted to address this question not only for the in-lab case. So this is great if you're building a tool that can help tutors you know, save some, uh, save some uh, exertion from running around a physical lab. Uh, but I want to think about scale. So I want to design something that not only works in person, but also works in this online case. If you're in a MOOC or in Khan Academy or in some online learning platform, you may have 100 or so people online at once uh, working in various ways. And you want to be able to help them in real time. 
So I made a system called CodeOpticon, uh, which is the first one to many tutoring interface. So how it works roughly is they have a tutor on their computer and they're monitoring a group of learners in real time as they're coding. Uh, to show how this works, I'm going to show a super simple example, which is just one tutor and one learner. Uh, on here, on the left side is the learner's code editor. So this can be implemented in any, say, web-based editor. I put it on the Rosetta site because that's the platform that I, that I have. And the right side is the tutor's view. So this video will play twice. First, uh, look at the left side for the learner, and then the whole thing will play again. We're going to look at the right side for the tutor. So a learner is on the site uh, trying to write a program for maybe homework. So product function, x, y is arguments. And then now they change their mind, A and B is arguments. OK, how do you return a product? You use the x sign, because that's what it looks like in math. And when you try to compile and run it, there's some bizarre error that is not helpful. So maybe it's a lowercase x. OK, play the same thing again. Now look at the uh, right side for the tutor. The tutor sees the learner's action streaming in uh, in chunks uh, nearly in real time. So green is a diff for adding and a flashing red shows deletion. So in this way, the tutor can see what the learner is um, doing. And then when they run their code, uh, you, they see the error right away. And the change and then another error. OK, so now they can actually go in a history slider and just go backwards and see the chunks of what the learner was doing and, and compiling and running, um, just back and forth, uh, to try to get some context. And then they can just start a chat uh, that's a private inline chat with the learner. And this pops up, and they can have a private one-on-one -on -one chat now. Uh, so in sum, the tutor's view of one learner is to summarize in this tile of their compiling and editing activities with history and chat. Um, so how does this scale up to more than one learner? Uh, the interface is pretty straightforward, is we just put it in a grid. So this is, on a laptop, you have about 10 spots. If you have a big computer, you may have 15 on a big monitor. Um, the first thing here is that this is easily deployable. We have modular some engineering work is that the learner can use their existing interface. So if they're programming in Rosetta or they're on Codecademy or on uh, some MOOC, we have to instrument that interface, uh, that, that code, to send the data to the tutor in real time. But they're just working on the original IDE. It's not like they have to go to some special thing just to use this. So this is deployable on existing sites. Uh, there's a history slider to restore context. This is really important because, as you can imagine, you can't actually see everybody working in real time because there's so many people. You can only attend to probably a few at once. So if you miss something, you can just quickly slide back um, and, and get the context. You can start a text chat with anybody you want and just open up these multiple text chats. So each one of these are private one-on-one -on -one chats, as though you're helping someone privately. Um, and of course, the obvious question is, what if there are more than 10 learners? So you can imagine more people joining in down here and piling down. So if you have 100 people and people coming in and out, then you're going to have to scroll a lot. Uh, but the main observation is, especially in an online setting, people have very wildly different levels of activity. Someone may be watching a video in another tab or going on Facebook. And someone may be frantically trying to edit and, and debug and getting errors. So we have a pretty simple heuristic that periodically reshuffles around some tiles to, to bubble up the learners who are most recently active. And then when they become inactive, they get pushed down. And the idea is that the tutor's main field of view, they're seeing the people who are most recently uh, doing things. And this is a very simple heuristic, um, and, and it's worked reasonably well in the first pass. But there, there's many ways to improve this heuristic right here. So the questions that everyone is thinking about is, one, the most obvious one is, how many people can actually someone handle using this interface? Um, two is, can they successfully help learners? And three is, how, does, uh, how do they feel this compares to um, a real life tutoring situation. To find out, I did a, a study that was both uh, in the lab and online. So the tutors were in lab, physically in lab, eight subjects, one at a time, just uh, one person sitting in front of the computer at a time. This was the staff from the intro course that all held these lab hours. This is exactly the target population. These are the people who would walk around doing, doing lab hours. First time using the tool. Uh, I just said spend 30, give them tutorials, said spend 30 minutes helping anonymous learners on the Rosetta website in whatever way you feel most comfortable. So again, we wanted to see, you know, to emulate what they would have done in lab normally. Uh, this, there was no kind of tasks or quotas saying you must help five people in a half an hour or whatever. Uh, 
The people online knew during the session that they were being monitored and their actions were all being monitored, but, uh, but they weren't expecting the, the proactive help. Um, so this is akin to the customer service case where you're browsing a website and someone pops up and says, it looks like you're buying shoes. And not, ex not surprisingly, most people close the tab. Um, <laughs> or they didn't speak English because it came from hundreds of other countries and they didn't understand it. So um, this really, this simple sort of first study is really a worst case scenario because if you were really to use this tool in, an, you know, in a real way, the tutors would know how to use the tool and the learners know about it and we have say virtual office hours. But so let's see how they did even given this anonymous scenario. Uh, what each squiggly line is one uh, session, so there are eight of them. This is how many learners are online at once. So they hover around 50 at once. Um, Every 30 minute session, about 200 people came in and out. So this is because this online site, people are going coding and then closing the tab or leaving or stuff. Um, so this is around the range of people being monitored. So a few dozen. Um, in a MOOC, maybe there'll be a few more, maybe 100 or so. Uh, notice that most people went over the 30 minute time limit. And that gets into this question here of how do the tutors feel while they're using this interface? Uh, the biggest feeling they reported both uh, from their actions and their, their think aloud was that they, they felt this great feeling of immersion. That they felt that first it was kind of some of this foreign kind of interface, but they really got into it pretty fast after about the first few minutes of looking around. Um, everybody pretty much went over the time limit. Um, they didn't show any visible signs of fatigue or overload, even though I didn't like strap an EEG on their head. Uh, but they they felt this was enough that they could just keep going just like a lab hour. Also, they said this was way less tiring than having to physically run around. They're sitting at their desk. It turns out, you know, as expected, they selectively attended to things. Um, I didn't do eye tracking, but the mouse tracking is reasonable because you can kind of see people's mice going to certain places. Authenticity was a big thing they reported as well, that they felt like they were tutoring in real life with um, their real personalities and style showing. So some people were a lot more reticent, some people were a lot more proactive jumping in and trying to help people. And, and the way in which they engaged with learners differed as well. Um, how does this compare to in-person tutoring? Big advantages were they can control their own pace better. So they reported they love having a dashboard to, ha to have situational awareness so they could see what was going on and selectively help people instead of people raising their hand and them running around frantically. Uh, the history slider is super helpful and something you can't get in real life that they really liked. And um, they could help about, it turns out they could help about three people at once. Uh, so this is a log of how many chat windows they had open, concurrent conversations. So they kind of, some people started off slow and chatted, some people chatted right away. It's around two or three at once. And um, this, this number kind of makes sense because what happens when you're helping someone, they're not responding usually in real time. You give them a hint, you ask them a question, they go off for a while to do something. So it's nice to have this dashboard so you can help somebody else. Yes, question. To simultaneously make an announcement to everyone that they're helping, like if they notice people are having the same problem. Yeah, that's a great question about broadcast. About if if you see five people are having the exact same error, you might want to broadcast. That's not currently in the system, but we could definitely implement this. Um, the reason why I didn't think about this for the original version was that I wanted to assume a kind of in the wild situation where everyone's working presumably on different problems or at their own pace. But you can imagine if you deployed this in a class in a uh, lab hour saying, we are all working on merge sort now, start. And you all have the same context. We could do that and we could do even really cooler things with clustering and other stuff when we have the same context. That's a great, that's a great idea. Uh, disadvantages, uh, people complain that text was too low bandwidth. There was these small text boxes. I mean, you can't really get really deep there. And that uh, they were afraid that reshuffling may penalize learners who were actually stuck and sitting there but not active, right? So that's the, the uh, that, uh, that prioritized activity has that drawback. One way, to, a simple way to fix this is in a production version of this is to have a get help button so the learners can summon the tutor privately for help and that's a signal that they need help. Uh, what did the learners uh, do in these sessions? So about two to three learners confirmed help in each 30 minute session. That's them saying, you know, blah, 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 thanks, you fixed my problem. Or like, oh, I really wish I had this. Um, this is despite the fact that these are completely unsolicited. So in a, you know, in a real class situation. Huh? That's right, that's right. We injected those as well. Um, actually, some of the ones, I would love to go behind. Some of the ones, you know, they were asking, are you a bot? All right. And I said, yes. Yeah. Uh, they said, no. Um, yeah, so it turns out if you start too generic, people think you're a bot, right? If you're like, oh, do you need help on this? Then they might actually think you're a bot. Whereas if you are more targeted. So it's interesting, some of the users, they started off not getting good responses. And then they, they try to think of how do we pass the Turing test here myself and, and, and actually help them better. 
Those types of knowledge, again, this time at the lower two levels of loop taxonomy, and here's some examples of, uh, these are mostly kind of language or runtime specific things they were helping with. So this is typical, the sort of beginner errors you're, you're helping people debug. Uh, so a tutor, it ends up being a modern, but a few dozen learners that help about three at once. Um, again, with this BM being their point is that uh, pretty much everyone said that they wanted this tool even for their in-person courses. And, um, and a big benefit they said was that, you know, they just didn't want to run around. Um, they don't want to run around live and they wanted to be able to have, feel more control over their tutoring. Um, and this idea of process history and surfacing it can start overcoming some of the limitations of real time monitoring multiple people. So just a simple idea of having a history slider really helps a lot. Because if you don't have histories, then you have to really see what goes on in real time and that's not gonna, that's not gonna scale. And then beside, despite this low bandwidth chat, the tutors found it uh, to be an immersive and an authentic experience um, for doing this sort of light lab style kind of uh, proactive tutoring. Uh, so what Coachella, uh, Codopticon does is push out on the scale even more, right? So it goes from one to one to one to many. And thinking beyond programming, so what if everybody could watch everybody else working all the time, right? What if we had a Codopticon for every student? So, you know, intellectual honesty issues and copying code issues notwithstanding, you know, what can we gain from actually seeing what other people in the class are doing? Um, you know, this, this reminds me of, so my wife is a dentist. She actually trained at UCSF uh, just uh, you know, a few minutes up in San Francisco. And they have these labs where they just have 100 stations with physical apparatuses and computers and everything. We have instructors and students just roaming around looking at what each other is doing. And um, can we think about how to do this online? And we can even do better online because we have histories in other sorts of invisible state they don't have in person. Uh, the, you know, the problem that came up when working on Code, uh, Codopticon and Coachella, both the systems, is that we're presuming that there are tutors available, right? You're presuming there's some situation where there's someone there to help you, uh, but what if there is nobody available in the worst case scenario? And for that, uh, we turn to uh, the fellow learners. So if there's no tutors available, uh, what about if you summon other learners for help? So on the Rosetta site, we get about 60-ish people, up to about 100, depending on time. These are people online at at once, and a MOOC, there may be around 100. So uh, here are some, you know, start of some ideas for uh, how do you leverage the crowd. So um, I have a student, Mitchell Gordon, who's working with me. We had one paper come out with some preliminary results on this, but can we have the crowd create tutorial? So can we put a piece of code on, ask it about something about its runtime semantics, form out to the people who are currently on the site, and have them be able to now run the code and surface the internal details and see what's going on, and make annotations uh, of what they think is happening, and then do the usual crowdy things of voting and filtering and, and aggregation, and, and can they come up with reasonable tutorials? And it turns out for simple, basic kind of CS1 examples, they, they do a reasonable job. Another thing is peer tutoring. So we have all these dozen people online. Can we match them up to each other or make suggestions for them to help each other uh, because there are no experts available? So we could use things like their activity level, their skill level based on what they're editing. So you can say like, oh, it looks like you're working on linked lists. Would you like to work together with Bob or Carol who are also struggling with linked lists? So, you know. It implies that I'm struggling. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, yes, well, it looks like you're struggling with linked lists. Or maybe you can help Bob or Carol. Um, uh, you want, obviously there's a ton of you know, hand waving here of you know, how do you not make this into chat roulette or something you know, <laughs> totally mismanaged, um, but the, the crowd is there. So this again pushes it out to, uh, from one to many, uh, to many to many. So uh, you know, to, to sum up really what, what's going on here is that we really wanna provide someone like Mrs. Hamilton with more than just uh, these static online materials, right? So if, if she can't get face-to-face, -face, we really want in the future in these online learning environments to provide a spectrum of options depending on kind of trade-off of fidelity and scale. And I've, I've presented these cases for programming here, but we can imagine generalizing these ideas to learning other skills if you could think about how to visualize things and how to surface uh, the histories. Um, the ideal here obviously is high fidelity and high scale. So what does that mean? Um, maybe it means mobile wearables because more and more people will just have them with them at all times. Uh, maybe it means higher fidelity things like VR or even brain computer interfaces. So you know, these, these are kind of wild blue sky ways to, to think about this. But you know, so far we've had to make this trade off. So in sum, the question I started with is how do we scale up um, the benefits of face-to-face -face learning online? 
And the approach I've taken in this talk is to, uh, by surfacing procedural state, what's going on step by step inside of some black box, and then also surfacing the history. And then fostering an environment where you can do real time monitoring and chat so that people are actually engaged in real time. And uh, to put this much more simply, it's actually a really simple idea, which is uh, to surface the invisible and then talk about it. So just find out some way to surface what's going on underneath the covers and let people talk about uh, those things so that they have a much more richer conversation than just talking about, say, the code. And uh, I've shown this for programming, but I think there's, these things can apply for kind of physical design activities, for things like medical education, and even for something as remote as law, where you know, everything is very text-based and inherently uh, not visual. Um, and with that, I'd like to include my talk, and I'd be happy to take more questions. I'm around, so I'd be happy to take more questions as well. So thank you. very interested to see what your scheduling solution is um, for getting several people across the globe who actually want to talk to each other mm -hmm. at the same time. We've had a lot of difficulty doing this with MOOCs mm -hmm. um, where you just don't have the volume of people who want to talk to each other. And then it's also spread out over like a 24 hour clock. Too, right. in some places. And this was in a, a MOOC. Right, and with so, you know, hundreds of people. Yeah. yeah, sometimes you have to make like scheduled times for mm -hmm. this and it gets really sort of like you'd like to just surface the invisible, <laughs> but sometimes you have to like force the structure on it mm -hmm. to make it work. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about, you just have like a large volume to make that work or? Yeah, I think that's an open challenge. Of, I mean, the question of even if you have hundreds of people, they're in different time zones, they have different contexts. Um, one way to think about this is, uh, you know, I'm proposing something totally synchronous, real time. The existing state of the art in a MOOC is totally asynchronous, is a form. One way to think about this is bridging the two, right? So I think uh, uh, something uh, design things like Facebook Messenger. I, I like, or Slack, where you can chat in real time, but it's also kind of persistent, so you can come back in an hour and, and talk as well. So imagine some kind of design that, that bridges that, I think. I think maybe one way to scale across time. I'm not convinced that you need to go to a sort of a bus stop model where it's like you know, three times a day is necessarily a failure. Right. Because mm -hmm. I mean, that structure could be, yeah. Yeah, it's useful structure. It could force people to like get something ready before the deadline and mm -hmm. have positive mm -hmm. effects of that as well. Yeah, I think this could be used as the basis for these more structured activities like talk about and, and, and things. Cool, we have one back yeah. there. Um, did you try this with uh, very large programs? So all the examples you showed were very right. short. I tried it out, it was really cool actually. But um, I'm curious like if you had like a 100 line routine, like, does this scale to that? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the thing that I totally didn't cover is the scalability of the visualizations themselves. So the way to think about that model is uh, this is what you would draw on a board. So uh, you probably don't want to debug something with a million nodes on, you know, because you can't draw on the board. So um, there's two issues is how long the code is and also how complex the runtime state is. So you could have 100 lines of code, but it's generating only a few objects and the objects are changing. That's, that's fine. But in general, I would say 50 lines of code at most with maybe a dozen or two dozen objects. Because beyond that, you can't even hope to draw it on the board. So you have to make something smaller. That's a good question. Yes? I had a similar question. I was wondering uh, in the future if you thought it would be a useful direction to let the people who are coming up with the curriculum for a MOOC or something create their own custom uh, visualizations. Like, So if you're teaching an OS class, mm -hmm. which is not like five line codes, like you could just have like a big box for like this part of the OS and like a big box for this part of the OS and let the instructor like come up with their own ways of visualizing it. Yeah, so the question about kind of custom visualizations that instructors can create. And I was starting to get into that with the Rosetta, that graphical grammar idea. So you can imagine extending that grammar a bit more generally to components and boxes and diagrams and stuff. And then you have this sort of spec so that, uh, you know, in say an OS class, you have some library that uh, someone is writing your, uh, I don't know, your thread scheduling code in. And by calling these functions, the visualization knows that to render this function is to use a box or a arrows or whatever. And then you could have the same ideas. Yeah, so I think those will be very domain specific, but we can think about generalizing that even more. But yeah, so so far I've just focused on triple but that's a great, great direction. Um, yes? Yeah, it's sort of connected to that. I think it seems like, you know, so far in the in the MOOC world, what's really taken off, right, are these per, uh, 
or a lot of classes that are around the topics of computer science because obviously they lend themselves very well mm -hmm. to be visualized on a 2D computer screen. And so looking at other engineering disciplines, for example, things like mechanical engineering, yeah. there's many, many f or less, uh, or less or fewer, anyway, uh, there are less courses of these other disciplines because I think, you know, it's, it's harder to capture maybe a, you know, free body diagram mm -hmm. and be able to run through it step by step. So have you got, guys thought a little bit about looking at these other visualizations that might work well for more spatial information? Yeah, that's a great question about other topics. So uh, you know, immediately comes to mind is we want to start with 2D and then imagine, you know, 3D CAD-like things. Um, I, I haven't looked into it personally myself, but my suspicion is that you know, given the right design and instrumentation, you can't do it because I, I don't know about how these are programmed. If it's some declarative language, if it's some kind of you know Verilog thing, or you know with circuits or stuff. The problem is for most of like you know tri tri other types of engineering, right. there isn't a programming language for right. it. That is, I mean, MATLAB is maybe often used in education mm -hmm. for that, but I think there might be some underlying things that are more similar to like you talked about in the beginning, like physics uh, as, as like having, you know, you have these misconceptions about physics. Similarly, you know, uh, these lend themselves to these other engineering disciplines. Yeah, I think part of that is you may want like a direct manipulation interface for creating these things. Right? So there's these micro worlds thing in physics where you can drag blocks and springs and then run a physical simulation of that. So maybe that's perhaps part of that. People can, and to surface that, you have, you know, time steps, right? It's like you can step through time and see the ball accelerating. So each frame there, it's going down even more. The spring is accelerating or decelerating. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, people like Brett Victor have looked into these sorts of expanding time into space sorts of visualization. So th this is all super interesting um, to go into for future work, though. There's a lot in programming, and I think the, and I think even more broadly, um, as Sean's point is, the, what about like 3D, like like physical world things like this, right? Like this is even way harder. So do you do camera capture? Do you do, you know, do you have smart materials? So those are really open. Uh, here and then slide. Yeah, you, you seem to have a lot of really fine grained information about problems that people have and then sort of how they fix them, possibly even with some extra information about the kind of problem given an interaction with a tutor. Do you see any possibility of sort of using that model to sort of train a more automated kind of system where you're starting to gradually get humans out of the loop? Like, how much data do you have basically? Yeah, well, so the very important question, question here was about. Um, taking those interaction traces both with code and debug and also with chat, right? We have chat, uh, human annotated, you know, things about the code and using that to train, say, machine learning or train uh, program analysis or synthesis tools. I think that's also an awesome, other awesome direction. And the way, you know, as an HCI person, I don't want to put people out of work. So the way I would diplomatically bridge that is to say that these tools can help triage and augment people even more. So imagine a code opticon thing where since the tutor can't help everybody at once, the simpler kinds of help, we can get you started with a triage with an Eliza-like thing that starts asking you how you're feeling about the weather, or you know, how you're feeling about this part of the code. Did you look at the first line, second line? People who also were doing this were looking in this line of code. And then as it gets conversation started, maybe the human can jump in to do the thought, you know, the more AI complete sort of thing. But yeah, the, the data traces are definitely there and that's totally underexploited right now. And I would, it's another giant area I'd love to look into. And Sunday? I was going to say, it was interesting that you thought so a bit about the mapping between the underlying program state and how you chose to visualize it so you have this grammar going. And I was wondering what you thought, like maybe there's potential avenues for beyond using the visualization to help represent what's going on, whether there's ways to use the visualization interactively, you mentioned Brett Victor just now, like um, to help teach the underlying concepts. So like maybe more direct manipulation, like in a scratch sheet style. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what about you know when I say interacting now, it's really just stepping back and forth and seeing it. But what about actually being able to grab the visualizations and put stuff in place? Um, yeah. Yeah. Or going the other way, right? Like given visualization, generative code. One, the immediate thing that comes up, the immediate next step, 
adjacent there is to do active learning activities. So the first step is seeing the visualization, you built the right model, and then you fade away that scaffold and you say, here's my code, here's an incomplete diagram, drag the parts that should be there in and we'll tell you if you're right. And so turning the visualizations into an activity could give you more active learning and engagement that way. So that's that's one you know short term thing. A longer term thing is you know can you imagine learning a program with more visual paradigm rather than worrying about syntax, which other you know as you said other people have looked into as well. Uh, yep. I was thinking the problem of uh, lack of tutors. Did you ever think about I don't know? It's kind of controversial, but like charging or paying for uh, being or getting paid to be a tutor or even gamifying a little yep. bit. So you have like you're the top tutors or having some kind of a list that you can draw from and yep. get some recognition out of it. Right, so my question is about both paying tutors or gamifying and building this you know, Stack Overflow-like karma community uh, leaderboard thing. Um, I, I think the, the paying thing I'm, uh, I'm less inclined to do because uh, I think that it's, it, I, I think I want to draw on people's intrinsic motivation of uh, you're on the site learning and wanting to help people, um, similar to why people are posting on the MOOC forum. I want to draw on that sort of motivation rather than make it into a more traditional paid microcast kind of crowdsourcing sort of uh, situation. Um, and for the gamification thing, I think that's something to look into as well. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a bit afraid of people, you know, I think communities that are geared around gamification, uh, you know, Alex Sacker will have issues with exclusion and, and not being as friendly to beginners or people wanting to game it and, and game that way and such. Uh, but yeah, that's still very much in the future work section. And I think we have to have some elements of that. But I, uh, you know, I want to avoid money for now because I want to see how far can we push if we don't pay people because, you know, people voluntarily do this because it maybe helped them learn as well. Cool. Oh, one more? Or how are we doing on time? It's 140. Let's take one last one and then we'll... Okay, one last one. Yep. Cool. I really like your strategy of like looking at the real world uh, situations and, and trying to map certain things on into your, uh, the programs that you wrote. How did you go about like deciding like this is something that happens in the real world that we want to replicate because it's really great versus something that you would want to change because in the end you're trying to make something that's better right. than the real world? Yeah, that's a, that's a deep question. I'm trying to think of... Uh, I don't have a great answer off the bat, but the way to, the way I approach it is, at first we want to at least get these common best practices, I mean, what's happening in lab, we want to at least get those online. And in the process, we can think about things like history or, or diagrams or, you know, multiple, you know, multiplexing to, to make it slightly better. Um, you know, the, the other part of that question is, you know, what kind of undesirable things in the real world do we not want to replicate online? And part of that, is why I did uh, kind of a lower bandwidth text sort of thing. So, uh, you know, if we ha let's say we had tried to really replicate the real world and have video for all the boxes instead of text, then I think that it would be much harder for people to use it because they feel more ashamed or more shy or so. So, yeah, so there were decisions of, you know, both for scalability and also for, you know, wanting people to use it to actually step, step back from the real world. Awesome questions. Thanks, Philip, one more time. Okay.